Good morning. I, I see our uh, participants are entering the Zoom room for the um, uh, second of our campus conversations, Healthy at NKU, moving forward with our fall plans. Um, I'm, I'm really delighted and grateful that all of you could join us this morning for what I hope will be a very engaging conversation, discussion, and questions that you may have. Uh, we have a, a wonderful group of panelists. Uh, Sue Art Rollins will be moderating this panel and she'll be introducing them in just a few minutes. Uh, I just wanted to say again, um, you know, we're, we're now very close to the end of July. We're about less than three weeks from the start of the semester. And um, under normal circumstances, this would be one of those times when uh, all of us are really busy gearing up for fall and getting everything ready and uh, our folks on campus getting spruced up with everything, just welcoming our students back after a uh, uh, you know, hopefully a slightly more quiet summer, but this is unlike anything we've seen. And so uh, I think gearing up for this fall is going to be quite different than, than anything we've ever done, I suppose. But um, I wanted to make sure that um, I conveyed to you that I know there's a tremendous amount of work that's happening in the background. Faculty and staff are doing uh, an incredible amount of work, just getting ready um, and preparing for everything, a very fluid situation as well. So again, uh, thank, you, uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, we looks like we have Sue over 400 folks um, mm -hmm. this campus conversation. That's really wonderful. And uh, I think the outcome is uh, for our folks, our panelists to share uh, some of what's going on, what the planning is, and really uh, spend most of the time for you to be able to ask questions so we can address as many of them. And in fact, if there are things we haven't thought of, this would be a great opportunity for us to keep track of that. We still have time and get things uh, ready for the fall as well. So again, thank you all for joining us. And Sue, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, President Vardia. Our plan for uh, the fall and returning to campus is called NKU Moving Forward Fall 2020. This is a flexible, evolving response to the pandemic and the need to develop creative options for NKU going forward. I'd first like to introduce to you the panelists for today. Valerie Hardcastle is the Executive Director of the Institute for Health Innovation and Vice President for Health Innovation. Lori Southwood is our Chief Human Resources Officer. Tim Ferguson, our Chief Information Officer. Zaidi is uh, our Associate Vice President for S Facilities Management. Andy Meeks is Director of Business Operations and Auxiliary Services, and Arnie Slaughter, who is our Interim Chief Student Affairs Officer and Dean of Students. We also have helping us today, Jason Best, Assistant Provost for Special Projects. He'll be fielding the questions and uh, helping us uh, get some answers to you today. So at this point, um, I'd like to just tell you that we have a series of presentations followed by plenty of time for uh, questions and answers. So please feel free to submit your questions uh, via the Zoom uh, question and answer feature. I'll go ahead now and turn it over to Valerie Hardcastle for our first presentation. I'm going to start by providing just sort of a larger philosophical or theoretical approach for how we think about um, keeping NKU as healthy as possible through the pandemic. So if you could go to the next slide, please. The way we are approaching this when we're thinking in terms of health and safety is to assume the most conservative radical position possible, which is to assume that everyone is contagious at all times. And if we could create a campus that's safe and keeps everyone safe, if everyone had COVID-19, then we know we have a campus that would be safe for uh, when everyone does not have COVID-19. So what we have developed and what you're gonna hear as um, the presentations go through are all the protocols that we've developed to diminish viral spread under the conditions that everyone is contagious as much as possible. Recognizing that nothing is foolproof, but these are the protocols that we believe would guarantee 
as much as possible, the least amount of viral spread, assuming the most contagion. Next slide. But to start it off, I want to answer a question that um, I get a lot and I know other people get a lot as well, which is why aren't you testing everyone? I hear so-and-so is testing everyone. Why aren't you doing this? And so I wanna spend just a couple of minutes talking about the types of tests that are currently available for COVID-19 and um, why as an institution, they're not as relevant to us as one may assume. And I think it's very important to um, understand and appreciate the difference between an individual perspective, in which case, you know, for me personally, it would matter a great deal to me if I, if I had COVID-19 and I, if I were in, exposed, I really want to know if I contracted the virus. And that's different from an institutional perspective where your concern is for everybody as a group. Okay. So the gold standard for um, testing for COVID-19 is what's known as the PCR test. You've probably seen pictures of it if you haven't already had the test yourself. That's uh, where they take a very long swab and they shove it up your nose and you know, they jokingly say they scrape your brain. Um, that's generally carried out either by a medical professional or it has to be carried out under the supervision of a medical professional. The nose swabs, are um, put in a solution and sent off to a laboratory for test looking for um, the virus itself. The turnaround time, as you've probably re been reading in the newspapers, has been increasing. Here in Northern Kentucky, the turnaround time is about three to five days. So you take the test and, you know, if everything aligns in three days, you'll learn whether you're positive. Now, if the test comes back positive, you definitely have COVID-19. If the test come back, comes back negative, what you know is you did not have COVID-19 when you took the test. So you could have contracted it over the intervening three days. You could have also been exposed right before you took the test, but you haven't de developed enough viral load for it to show up as an illness yet. And so you could develop COVID-19 even though you immediately, you know, you took the test after you got infected, there's not enough virus and then you become ill. So from a safety standpoint, I'm sure you can see right away, it's not as helpful because those people might be coming to campus right after they took the test or they get the negative response, they've been exposed, but they believe they're positive. A second sort of test is what's known as the rapid antigen testing. This is very rapid um, and you can buy a machine and put it in your office and every day people can come in and just do their own navel swab. It's done in the front of the nose or it's done in the mouth orally. So it's much easier to do. The problem with this test, it has very low sensitivity. What that means is right now, even when the viral spread, if the viral spread were really high, one out of five people who are positive will show up um, as negative. And so um, the challenge there, of course, is that is not going to provide good results for um, trying to weed out, to keep people away from you who are not positive. Now, if it does test positive, it means you do have COVID-19. But unfortunately, if it tests negative, then um, that's not informative or as informative as we'd want it to be to make a decision about whether you should come to campus or not. And finally, there's antibody testing. It's also known as serology testing. That's tests for the immune system to see if you have antibodies. And what that will tell you is it shows that you had the disease in the past. Now, that could be an indicator that... Um, you are no longer contagious and you won't get the disease anymore, so you kind of get a safe pass. Um, but unfortunately, at this point, though we believe if you had COVID-19, you probably won't get it again in the near future, we're not 100% sure of that. So again, from an institutional standpoint, that's not very helpful information, even though from an individual standpoint, it might be really, really important. So the reason why we're not testing everybody is that none of the tests gives us the information that we really want, which is, you know, something like you spit in a cloth and it turns pink and you immediately know you're sick. There is no test like that right now, which is why we go back to our original standpoint, which is we just assume everyone's contagious. 
because that would be the best assumption given the sorts of information we have available. And then we try to build our protocols from there. So I'll stop here and then uh, turn it over to the rest of the team who'll be able to explain exactly what those protocols are. Good morning. Thanks for joining us today. I hope you find this time valuable. I'm gonna do my best to share information and answer all your questions. But uh, to be honest, there are many experts across this campus with more spe specific knowledge and expertise than, than I have or, or that, that's here on this panel. Those that are serving on the COVID preparedness team, on the division teams, including the HR team, are working with employees daily and supporting you every day through this transition. Some of your questions may need their expertise. So rest assured that we will be following up with all of the, um, on all of the questions and providing answers after today's conversation. So on, on our scheduling, staffing, um, considerations as we transition back into the semester. Our overall campus schedule philosophy is to open with a blended, flexible environment with modifications to minimize risk so that we can allow for in-person services to be provided. Departments will determine what their minimum staffing levels need to be to meet the needs of those they serve. Some offices may actually extend hours to serve their populations like post-traditional students. Some offices may be entirely remote, but employees not required to be on campus per their job responsibilities or responsibilities for department coverage will continue to work remotely. So some questions to consider in planning the return and the reopening of offices. What work or activities need to be done on site or at another location away from home? What can't be done remotely? What locations are necessary, buildings or rooms that would re be required for you to complete your work? What is the minimum staffing level necessary to meet those you serve? And to practice social distancing and de-densifying, what is the maximum staffing level you will approve? What precautions will you take as you re-enter for the health and safety of those involved? This would be include things like social distancing, um, the protective uh, equipment, um, alignment with the university plan, signage, and um, uh, cleaning resources. To assist in the planning process, we are developing a Qualtrics survey moving forward the departmental plan that will be rolling out in the next couple of days. Each department will be required to complete a moving forward departmental plan for each location. And we'll have more information for you in the coming days. Next slide. So as we transition, we've rolled out training um, for employees. It's mandatory that all faculty, staff, and student employees um, complete the online training, NKU Moving Forward, COVID-19 and employee campus re-entry training. For faculty and staff, this is um, uh, provided to you through the Safe Colleges platform, and you should receive an email that gives you directions or a link to the Safe Colleges um, training module. If you have not received that link um, or you can't access it, you're having problems accessing it, contact HR and we can help you with that. Students will, um, their training will be delivered through Canvas. And again, if you're having difficulty um, with that, contact HR. And just to reemphasize, it's student employees that need this training. The training must be completed prior to your first day back on campus or no later than August 31st if you're not back on campus prior to that or not back on campus, planning to be back on campus at all. The training still needs to be completed. We'll be running weekly reports and sharing those with the vice presidents so that we can track 100% um, participation. 
In addition, we have put together a manager's playbook um, to guide supervisors, managers, and leaders as they transition employees back to campus, provide resources for those they serve, and also still coordinate and support the employees working remotely. Um, there'll be, I believe we'll be rolling that out later this week. Um, it will be on, posted on our website and it'll be directly sent to all of those listed in our manager database. In addition, Marquita Barron, who is the training director, has developed a series for managers, the Summer Speaker Series. The series was scheduled to take place this week, and actually uh, a couple of the modules did take place earlier in the week, but unfortunately, Marquita has had to temporarily, we will be rescheduling, we'll send out information, and we'll contact those that had registered directly. Next slide, please. All members of the university community must self-screen for symptoms each time every day that they plan to be on campus prior to coming to campus. They'll do this through the NKU um, app, Healthy at NKU app. They can be found um, through the NKU app. If you have the app, you open the app and you can't find this um, link, um, it may be that you need to refresh um, the app and then it'll pop up for you. You can also access this through employee self-service. So what's gonna happen to that information? Well, every day at 9 a.m., time administrators will receive a daily notification which will list all the individuals in their area who have completed the health and temperature screening. That includes faculty, staff, and student workers. They'll also be able to access throughout the day through manager self-service to check and see if possibly the employees had accessed or completed the app um, after the 9 a.m. Uh, distribution from email. So if um, you discover that an employee is on campus, scheduled to be on campus, working on campus, but is not showing up on the app, on the list, then they need to be contacted, told to complete the app immediately, or they'll need to um, leave campus. The information that the time administrators receive is just whether or not the employee has accessed the app. So no um, results or information um, beyond that uh, of, of what the employee has indicated in the app will be shared with time administrators. And then the, um, the app will tell employees, indicate for employees if they're able to, to report to campus or if they're not, um, if they should not report to campus. And if it tells them that they should not report to campus, it will inform them they should notify their supervisor and also contact their health professional to uh, determine whether um, testing is uh, required. Next slide, please. So what happens if you need to be off or unable to work? Well, as part of the CARES Act, there's a new leave, the emergency paid sick leave. This new leave provides up to two weeks of paid, full or partial pay, depending, leave um, for eligible employees if they're unable to work on site or remotely for the following reasons. And there's six reasons that this act uh, lists. The employee is subject to a government order quarantine related to COVID. If the employee has been advised by their health provider to self-quarantine due con to concerns related to COVID. If the employee is experiencing COVID symptoms and is seeking a medical diagnosis. If the employee is caring for an individual who's subject to a government ordered quarantine or um, a healthcare provider's recommendation to self-quarantine. If the employee is caring for ch a child whose school has been closed due to COVID and the employees experience any other substantial similar conditions specified by the Secretary of Health and Human Services in consultation with the Secretary of the Treasury and the Secretary of Labor. So as, as if more details come out or things change with that, we would keep you posted and have that posted on the HR website. There's also 
um, an extended family, an extension of family medical leave um, benefits, referred to as the emergency family leave. And this allows for up to 10 weeks of partial paid um, family leave. Eligible employees may take this leave if they are unable to work due to the need to care for minor child whose school or daycare is closed during COVID. Next slide, please. So according to the CDC, there are individuals, um, you all may be familiar with this list by now, that have a higher risk of COVID infection. And we have that listed here. Employees who health condition falls in one of these categories may seek temporary COVID workplace arrangements by using ADA or uh, what we're referring to as courtesy accommodations or alternative work arrangements um, that um, more information can be found on the HR website. Approval for accom uh, accommodations or any alternative work arrangements is an interactive process that involves the employee, their supervisor and HR. So if you have questions or believe that you fall into this category, please contact HR. Next slide, please. And I wanted to remind everyone, these are difficult times and we are providing a lot of resources and support through um, our employee engagement and well-being uh, series. Um, there's a lot of information that's out on the HR website and the training and development website. Uh, with a lot of resources for employees, managers, and family members. But we also have a very comprehensive employee assistance program. It's offered through Aetna, and they provide services not just for our employees, but for their family members as well. It's 24-7 access. Um, if you, it, it, it's, it's national. It's not limited to uh, the greater um, Cincinnati, Northern Kentucky area. Um, and if you're eligible for health care coverage through NKU, you and your family members are, um, are eligible for this service. It's free and confidential. And some of the, the range of services is vast, but I've listed some here that are commonly used um, for situations with dealing with stress, family issues, alcohol or substance abuse, relationship difficulties, legal or financial concerns, but also help locating child and elder care needs in the area. As I said, it's a free service. It's available to you and your family, eight sessions per topic per calendar year, and the, se the sessions are entirely confidential. We, we do not get any information about who, um, which of our employees have accessed this service. All we get is uh, volume numbers. Um, from them. And then I've listed contact information here as well, but all of this information can be found on our website. And with that, I think I'm turning it over to Tim. Thanks, Lori. Good morning, everyone. Just going to give you a few updates of what IT has been up to this summer and other information you need for being ready for the fall semester. Uh, one of the most important things we've been doing this summer is getting our classrooms ready for hybrid instruction. The important thing to note there is if you're a faculty and you're gonna be using one of those classrooms, there will be training and one-on-one -on -one, uh, support that you can get to learn about any of those changes in the classroom. So there'll be additional information coming out on that topic. In addition to the classroom efforts, we've also made changes relative to Wi-Fi on campus. Uh, we've improved Wi-Fi in many of the open areas and there are some very specific improvements in classrooms. Uh, due to the needs that we're going to see in the fall semester. For faculty and staff, if, if you have not taken advantage of the ability to use your work phone remotely, uh, that software is still available and we'd like for you to request that through the help desk if you would desire that capability. There's been substantial technology improvements in Steely Library this summer. Um, you will, when you get back to campus, you will see uh, major improvements in the study rooms, labs, the computer equipment, in all those places, uh, Wi-Fi has completely been redone, and then they will be launching a new website as well. So that will be very helpful for anybody needing to access the library resources. Another major improvement over the summer was an upgrade to the student union ballroom when it comes to technology. It's important to note that in addition to all new technology, it was also upgraded so it could be a classroom. 
and do lecture capture and hybrid instruction. And there will be classes using in that room th this fall. We've also been working on our computer labs uh, relative to social distancing and making sure we're in order there. So you can see the latest list of computer labs because there has been some changes there under quick links under student. And then there will be some new rooms available this fall that we're calling Zoom rooms. So if you're a student on campus and you need to take a class, an online class while you're on campus, there'll be some rooms available in some of the academic buildings where you can step into a room and participate in that class before maybe going to your next face-to-face -face class. Next slide, please. As you probably know, we are using Zoom for most everything on campus when it comes to large meetings, but especially for instruction. All faculty, staff, and students now have a full access to a Zoom Pro license. You get access to that by going to nku.zoom.us and logging in with your NKU credentials and you will access that Pro license. Uh, it's important to note that uh, Zoom has addressed the, many of the security concerns that came up early on in March and April. So we are very comfortable at this point with the security that Zoom provides and will continue to communicate updates through our newsletter. Relative to academic software and especially discipline specific software, we've been working through that over the summer. Uh, some things like Adobe uh, Creative Cloud, SPSS, et cetera, uh, is available for students that aren't coming to campus. They can request that through the help desk or in many cases, the faculty are already working with IT to make those requests. Other academic uh, software is available through our virtual labs that you can find on our website. And that's the primary way that students would get remote access to the software they need for, for academic functions. One of the key things that we've been doing since March and we continue to do and we'll do this fall is providing loaner laptops, tablets, headsets, and Wi-Fi hotspots to faculty, staff, and students that need those. Those are still available. We have uh, worked on our inventory to be prepared for the fall. And sometime soon, we'll be launching a digital request system so that you can request those through a, a URL versus having to contact the help desk. For now, uh, simply contacting the help desk or sending an email to norseit at nku.edu will uh, we'll make that happen, but we will inform you when the digital site is up and running. And then the NKU mobile app. So, we highly suggest that all faculty, staff, and students download the NKU mobile app. You can find that in the iOS, Apple, and Android app stores. We will use that for many things, including the ability to contact IT support, uh, to get access to the Healthy at NKU app that was described earlier by Valerie and Lori. And then we will also be doing important push notifications through that app to update you on, on information. Next slide. As far as how to get more information from IT, we are working on our website, it.nku.edu. Uh, you can go there and see the latest updates as we prepare for the fall. Uh, any updated training and support links will be there. And you can see our FAQs relative to, to our fall environment. To get IT support, uh, we have uh, set up the ability to request appointment-based support. Uh, that's gonna be available for in-person and virtual for the fall. So to deal with social distancing, you, you can simply make an appointment to talk to one of our IT team members um, virtually, or if you're on campus, you can meet with them one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, please see a, a newsletter coming out shortly that will explain how to do that. All of our academic buildings continue to have local IT staff available, and they will be available as well through the appointment-based system that I described in the previous bullet. For technology support, you, you can stop by the Norse Tech Bar that will open um, for the fall semester. You can do chat, email, and then also call the help desk as you always have been able to do at 6911. And then last but not least, we will be communicating a lot of our information relative to IT in our newsletters, and those will be ramping up again for the fall this week. And there'll be several between now and the first couple of weeks of semester and those go to all students, faculty, and staff. So please be watching out for those. Thank you, and I'll turn it over to Zaidi, I think, at this point. Thank you, Tim. Um, 
just like our other colleagues, facilities has been monitoring various forums. We've remained engaged with professional organizations, our peers, um, to find the best practices and develop an understanding of the trends, strategies, and challenges, particularly to this evolving situation. When it comes to construction, um, different universities reacted differently initially. Um, in places where there was a stay at home mandate for um, such businesses, work stopped, but most of the other uh, institutions took the advantage of vacant buildings and actually ramped up construction activity. Um, around March or later in that period, um, most universities um, either stopped or deferred all projects um, to conserve funds and to, uh, to reconsider uh, whether they needed to do those. At NKU, we were very deliberate and strategic in our approach. So some of the things that have continued, first is the master plan that is um, continuing to provide um, a, a visual concept of what the post-COVID physical plan would look like. The second, uh, we're very proud, uh, is the 300 bed residence hall that construction has already started and continues. And we are also moving forward with all of the projects that are intended for um, asset preservation and, and critical in nature. So we have not curtailed any of the projects that would, if not done, uh, diminish the quality of the, of the buildings that we have. For this fall, and most likely spring as well, all renovations, uh, reconfigurations, and non-essential projects are subject to cabinet review and approval. Um, and I would remind all of us to be very mindful that the pandemic is an evolving situation and it is quite possible that any of the projects, even if they're approved and proceeding, could suffer from uh, time overruns or cost overruns unexpected. Next slide, please. As you return to campus, you will find um, some changes in our protocols and the physical space. The first relates to de-densifying the campus. The campus planning and construction group has evaluated most of the instructional spaces, which are over about 150 and, and most of the office suites, um, and established maximum occupancy in those spaces. In many instances, we've also reconfigured the, the, uh, the furniture to ensure that proper social distancing can be maintained. Uh, spaces such as elevators, restrooms, corridors where it is difficult or impractical to maintain the six foot apart rule, we are going to rely on people uh, and their civic sense to avoid congestion and to quickly move through them without stopping or engaging in talk or, or making any stops in the corridors. Uh, consistent with and, and, and branded signage has been developed for the entire campus. This signage has already started arriving it includes floor decals, uh, wall mounts, um, and, and reminders. So this will be placed all over campus. Um, it is intended to inform and promote the awareness of social distancing and, and insist on behaviors that are aimed at stopping the spread of the virus. The next is the, uh, is the enhanced cleaning protocols. Uh, they, these were developed uh, after due consideration of what is being touted as the best practices in institutions of higher education. Uh, they were duly vetted by all of the COVID group and now they're posted on the uh, COVID page. Um, all of the instructional spaces that is classroom, labs, and the office suites will also be provided with an EPA approved uh, disinfectant in a spray bottle together with washcloth. This is intended for the use by individuals who may choose to uh, clean the desks um, or, or, or the common areas that they are using while they're in that space. Um, once these uh, bottles are empty, they could um, be um, refilled by the custodians who um, have access to additional uh, supplies. The ONM staff very early went ahead and purchased uh, plexiglass and we have uh, we surveyed the campus while many of you were not here yet and identified spaces where person-to-person -person, uh, transactions were expected, like the uh, help desk or um, the student services area, and installed uh, plexiglass screens. Where the areas that have been identified have already been, um, uh, uh, been completed, 
we are still receiving requests. So if you have uh, an additional need in your particular space, um, please contact us and you'll be able to, do, uh, to, to get an additional screen as well. As far as the HVAC systems are concerned in large commercial buildings, they present unique challenges. Now, most air filters that are installed on them prevent pollutants from entering the building. In this particular um, case, we're more concerned by the virus that is brought into the building by an individual and then has the ability to recirculate within the building. Ideally, the best way to do that is to ensure that all of the building air is exhausted and fresh air is brought in. Now, number one, it is, it is impractical to do that because then you're heating the environment and, and cooling the environment. And secondly, the systems are not designed like that. So we, we, we rely on what is called the air exchange rate. Um, we've calculated that and looked at the um, de-densification of the campus. We believe that the campus buildings will be occupied to less than 60 to 50% of occupancy. And therefore the air exchange rate within the buildings will be at least twice as good as what it was designed for. Additionally, we are looking and, and we have replaced many of the filters to a higher MERV rating. But um, as you do that, the issues that come up and have been, we have been cautioned against is that it may lead to uh, difficulties in temperature and humidity control. So we, we are watching and looking at um, whatever has been done, but this is the best practices that, in, that we are following and we will continue to do that. Um, the other thing that many campuses noted was uh, for the buildings to have been closed down, there was a possibility of uh, uh, bacteria growth. So our plumbing team has gone ahead and flushed all the systems throughout the buildings. And we're going to do them one more time before the actual classes start. We're pretty confident that um, we, we are in a very good uh, shape as far as that is concerned. Um, I'm, I'm proud to say that facilities has provided uninterrupted service during the pandemic thus far. Uh, we can always be reached um, by dialing 5660, which is the work control during uh, regular hours, or by calling the power plant at 5548. For on-site or in-person consultation, our offices on the seventh floor in admin and maintenance building uh, will be maintaining um, office hours that will be posted uh, uh, all through Monday through Fridays. Next slide, please. Some of the challenges that we face um, have to deal with the managing of expectations related to intensity and frequency of cleaning. In order to be responsive and responsible, we have determined that the best thing to do is to follow the best practices uh, that are being adopted in the institutes of higher education. Um, we got them vetted through the uh, COVID group and they've all been posted. Um, we have purchased additional fogging machines that will be used at night uh, in, uh, in elevators and spaces where there could be higher activity. And we'll go ahead and continue to um, concentrate on high touch surfaces to make sure that they are uh, uh, disinfected and, and sanitized. Um, the second relates to individual preferences uh, regarding social distancing, um, especially with regards to pedestrian circulation uh, on sidewalks and in corridors where it is impractical to to move through them while maintaining a six foot. Um, our effort and in, in campaign for, for information is going to be, you know, stay on the right side and move through them quickly. Do not stop, do not congregate. While you're on the elevators, make sure that you, you do not come close to people, face the other way, don't talk in the elevators and, and avoid elevators if you can take the steps. Um, I, I wish to assure, um, well, the, as far as the PPE and disinfectant supplies and all, um, some of them um, that we will be providing is the disinfectant spray as they're de depleted. Make, uh, you can request them through the work order system or simply ask one of the custodians in the building and you will get them. Um, if there are particular supplies that are needed for hand sanitizers, um, uh, et cetera, for office spaces, um, the uh, Office of um, Vice President Finance is, is procuring uh, one gallon uh, um, dispensing units that will be available. And uh, as departments uh, see the need, they could request them through that. Um, 
the face mask uh, question has come up uh, that the face mask uh, or the facial coverings to, uh, for the faculty and staff, um, that they will be available from August 10th. What about the people who may need to come earlier? Um, the answer is that we still have some supplies of the disposable mask. So if there is a faculty and staff person who needs to come to the campus and they do not have uh, a facial covering, they could stop at the uh, mail room and, uh, and, and pick them up uh, for themselves. Um, I wish to assure you that just like the rest of the colleagues of ours, um, facilities management is, is, is fully aware of your concerns and we are fairly confident that we have uh, done the due diligence and we are ready to offer you a, a, a safe and, and healthy campus as you return. Uh, this concludes my presentation, um, handing over to Andy Meeks, the Executive Director for Business Operation and Auxiliary Services. Andy. Thank you, Zaidi. Good morning, everyone. And again, thanks for uh, coming so that we can begin to uh, provide you guys with some information uh, about how we're opening. I'm going to take just a couple of minutes and cover three of the areas in business operations, the bookstore, uh, food and beverage, and then parking services. And I have four slides and you will, you can, as you can see from the very first one, they are mostly informational, so I'm not going to just sort of read through them, uh, but I'm going to hit the highlights and then obviously uh, we'll answer any questions that you have or if you want to email me uh, after the fact, I'll certainly get back to you. But let me start off with the bookstore. Uh, two or three important things. The bookstore has been uh, operational during the entirety of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, they have been conducting business online since uh, mid-March. Uh, they concluded the spring semester uh, and serviced our faculty and students for the summer uh, online, uh, whether it be textbook or adoptions. Uh, we will be doing the same thing in the fall. Uh, they are currently working. Uh, most of the adoptions are in, uh, but we are currently uh, providing for our students their textbooks. We are encouraging students to uh, conduct this business online and allow us to ship uh, your books to your primary residence. Uh, but as you can see from our schedule, the bookstore will be open to the public beginning August 3rd, and we will be prepared uh, to be open and to do business with the public both uh, in the soft goods and, and trade books, as well as textbooks and any other needs of the students and faculty. Uh, we will also, uh, and this information will come out just a little bit later in the semester, uh, we will be uh, receiving uh, primarily rental textbooks, but there could be some other things at the end of the fall semester uh, via UPS um, at no charge uh, to the student. And we recently held a drive-through, uh, which happened at the Student Union Circle, uh, where we can uh, have students uh, come to campus, uh, return their rental books or whatever uh, books they may have, and we can conduct that business uh, there as well. Uh, we encourage faculty uh, as the fall semester starts uh, at the earliest moment that you can get your spring textbook adoption in uh, so that we can get those in stock. I'm sure everybody can appreciate that uh, sourcing those textbooks is a little bit more difficult uh, than it might be uh, during other times. Um, you'll see this note at the bottom of this uh, slide and it's at the bottom of each uh, of the four slides. Um, because we are uh, retail type operations and retail services, uh, and we will be open to the public and we will be preparing uh, for that. Please note that we will be operating all of these locations under the COVID-19 protocols that have been established by the university, office of the governor and local health officials. So we're asking uh, that you review those, uh, that you uh, come to our establishments with your face coverings and are ready to go. Next slide, please, Tracy. OK, 
Okay, here's the food and beverage information. A uh, couple things, uh, food and beverage operations uh, for residential students has remained open uh, during this period. But as we prepare for the fall semester, uh, we have worked pretty diligently, pretty hard uh, on how we want to set this up uh, to ensure success uh, as we begin on August 17th. Uh, we've had a group uh, from the Commonwealth of Auxiliary Directors. We've met about five or six times during the summer uh, to discuss uh, specifically food and beverage operations. And so here's what we have. And I'll just say right from the beginning, please understand that um, before this year, I could have drawn you a, a pretty clear picture of what uh, food and beverage operations was going to look like on Monday, August the 17th. Despite my best efforts, I, I cannot come up with that picture right now of what it's going to look like, what the traffic is going to look like. And so uh, at the end of each week, we'll be reviewing and responding uh, to whatever the activity is on campus. Uh, but to move forward, uh, we're going to have, and Arnie will cover this uh, next, uh, roughly 1,120 residential students. Uh, we've worked with the residential staff uh, all summer. Uh, the Norris Commons Residential Cafeteria uh, will be open for the fall semester. Uh, the Bistro Cafe over in the East Village will not be open for the fall semester. Um, and so all residential food service will be happening in Norris Commons. And the first question I always get uh, when I cover that is, what about the shuttle? We have expanded uh, shuttle service uh, from the East Village uh, to Norris Commons uh, significantly, uh, primarily for that purpose. Uh, the first thing I always like to announce is that Starbucks will reopen on August the 3rd. Um, that usually makes everyone pretty happy. And then the week of August 10th, uh, we will begin residential dining in association with Move In. And we will also begin to open up our retail operations, uh, sort of moving towards uh, Monday, August the 17th. Um, you can see the hours. Uh, once again, those are our opening week's hours. They're subject to change. Um, as we see, uh, what type of traffic and what type of density we have uh, relative to food service. Next slide, Tracy. There's the Norris Commons hours, as you can see. Uh, when school starts on the 17th, uh, Norris Commons is open uh, from 7 a.m. till 10 p.m. Uh, continuously. And then we have some brunch and dinner hours. Uh, quick thing on dining rooms, uh, they will be open. Uh, at 35 to 40 percent capacity. So we are uh, happy for uh, everyone to use them. Uh, but please uh, try to be as respectful as you can uh, on the time that you spend, as others would probably like to use them as well. And you see our note on COVID-19 protocols. One last thing on food service. Uh, we've decided uh, for the fall semester, uh, with the exception of uh, students, faculty, and staff who are actually bringing their lunch uh, to campus, uh, and we have many that do that, that we are not going to be allowing any outside food on campus. Um, if you get a, a Jimmy John's delivery for your lunch or something like that, it will need to take place um, in the student union circle. Next slide. Tracy, please. Okay, parking. Uh, parking is currently, uh, we'll open the office on August 3rd. Uh, we are currently uh, conducting business uh, online uh, for a variety of things, but primarily faculty, staff, and student uh, parking uh, for the upcoming year. Uh, once again, we are asking that uh, if possible, do your business online. Uh, go to the parking website and update your file and make your decisions about parking. And then we will mail uh, to your uh, personal residence or deliver to your office uh, your parking hang tags uh, as they uh, apply. Uh, those that do not uh, 
choose uh, to buy parking passes for the year. We certainly understand that. We'll just remind you uh, that when you come to campus, you'll need to park in one of the three garages, uh, which are designated for visitor parking. And parking enforcement will be light uh, to almost non-existent for the first two weeks of the academic semester. Uh, the only citations that will be uh, handing out are people who are parked in lot in, which is a reserve lot, people who are parked in reserve stalls, which are throughout campus, and people who are parked in handicapped stalls. So that's it. As I said, I'll be glad to answer your questions. Uh, feel free to email me and I'll turn it over to Arnie. So good morning, everyone. Uh, first, thank you for attending uh, the session. And I wanna give a special welcome to our students who are uh, sitting and listening. Uh, we are excited about your upcoming return and look forward to seeing you on campus uh, pretty soon. Uh, next slide, please. So for this uh, section of the presentation, I will focus on four areas, student experience, university housing, health and counseling, as well as uh, campus recreation. In terms of the student experience, uh, we wanna make sure that our students know that they are supported and they have resources that are available for them to be successful in the classroom and as they navigate the experience. So we will continue with the NKU community care team that's led by the Student Conduct Rights and Advocacy Office, but includes representatives from a variety of different campus offices, including enrollment degree management, University Connect and Persist, as well as uh, several other areas that are here to support our students. Um, if a faculty member, staff member, a student or community member has a concern for a student, a student is experiencing some life circumstances or needs some assistance, uh, we do allow for individuals to submit a community care request for a particular student. And once we receive that, a representative from SCRA or from the community care team will reach out to that particular student, follow up and provide them with the resources and support they may need. Um, in addition to the all our referrals and the community care team, our Centers for Student Inclusiveness and Center for Student Engagement are also here to support our students, both in terms of providing them with resources, support systems, as well as opportunities to get connected and involved on campus. And in terms of getting connected, uh, we know that this upcoming fall is gonna be a little bit different and atypical than our previous years. So students, if you're listening, we encourage you to continue to check your emails, as well as download the My Engagement app, which will provide you with several different opportunities to get connected both virtually and online throughout your experience. Um, in terms of the experience, we anticipate doing a series of programs and events that will be both in-person as well as online. So the in-person events will definitely abide by social distancing of requirements, recommendations, and quantity limits, but the online programs and services will be facilitated by a variety of different offices as well as registered student organizations. In terms of the My Engagement opportunity, uh, we will have a link that will be available on our website and an app that will allow for students to explore the close to 260 registered student organizations that we have here on campus. That sounds like a lot, but there's a lot for our students to do. So if we have a student that has no idea where to start to get engaged and get connected, the My Engagement app and website will allow for them to complete a quiz and this quiz will help them to identify some of their passion areas, their interest areas, things they want to get connected. And the quiz will help kind of narrow down some options for the student to consider so that they can explore ways to get connected both virtually and also in person. In terms of uh, university housing, as Andy alluded to, we'll have approximately 1,100 students residing with us on campus. Um, many students have already received their assignments, uh, so they can log into their uh, housing portal at housing.nku.edu. As of now, um, the majority of our students, with the exception of about 30, have received their assignments. So if a student applied recently or they didn't complete their application, uh, those students are still in the queue. But as of now, outside of those 30 students, any assignment that has been provided has been emailed and sent through the My NKU port, or I'm sorry, the housing portal uh, for students to check where they're living, if they've been reassigned, as well as if they have a particular remaining. In terms of support and housing, we still do have residence hall directors that are living on campus to provide support for our students that are living in our facilities. In addition to our hall directors, we also have resident assistants. So our resident assistants are upper class students who've been in our first year student shoes or their last year or in previous years. So they're responsible for about 30-ish students. So they're there to ensure 
that our students have a support system while living in the residence halls and they feel connected and engaged on campus. In terms of the move-in day experience, uh, move-in week starts Monday, August 10th. Um, so for students who have a housing assignment, uh, you can go into your housing portal to sign up for move-in shifts beginning Monday, August 10th through the whole entire week. Uh, for students that are involved in early arrival programs, such as NKU Rocks and LAMP, uh, the director of that office or their designee will reach out to you to give you specific instructions on your move-in day time, et cetera. In terms of dining, as Andy alluded to, uh, traditionally we start dining on the traditional move-in day, but with us doing uh, shifts across the uh, five days of that particular week, uh, we will provide uh, dining options for our, our students who will be living on campus as soon as they move to campus on Monday, August 10th. And for those that are involved in early arrival programs, uh, we will make sure you have meals as well. Um, as I did alluded to for strategies, uh, we'll do significant cleaning protocols. So for those students who live in the traditional residence halls or in areas where there's a common shared bathroom, uh, those facilities will be maintained at least two times per day to make sure that we're cleaning, sanitizing, and ensuring that our students are, are, are safe and secure in the facilities that they're gonna be using. Um, in terms of the reduced occupancy model, um, we were intentional to reduce our occupancy so that we, we have areas where students have to share common bathroom space. Our goal is to have no more than three students or four students using any of the restroom facilities at one particular time. Um, if a student for some reason contracts COVID-19, uh, we do have a protocol in place for, for them to be uh, healthy, safe, secure, and also taken care of throughout their uh, quarantine process. So the first thing we ask for our students to do is to consult with their primary care physician or work with our health services area to um, ensure that they do have the COVID-19. And we also will work with them to provide them with some options in terms of um, housing strategies, whether they live in a single room already. So if a student does not have a roommate, they have the ability to self-quarantine in their particular space. If a student lives in a room where they do have a roommate, we do have some quarantine rooms that are held for the student to self-isolate. A third option for the student is to work with their families or support systems to, to determine if they want to return home for their quarantine experience. Uh, we do know that there are some concerns with probably going back home. So we want those support systems, family and students to have those conversations to determine if staying on campus is the best protocol or returning back home for that two-week quarantine experience is best for them. For students that are also experiencing uh, COVID-19, uh, our health services office will work with housing as well as the Student Conduct Rights and Advocacy Office to ensure that the student has everything that they need in terms of that two-week uh, quarantine experience. So meals will be delivered directly to the student. The Student Conduct Rights and Advocacy Office will work with the student's professors to let them know uh, confidentially that the student uh, will be away from their classes for period A through period B so that the professor can work individually with that student. If a student is quarantined on campus, uh, we will definitely make sure that they um, have that support system and we will consistently provide check-ins with them both email and online to make sure that they have everything that they need if they're experiencing some additional symptoms or if they need some additional support we'll continue to uh, reach out to those particular students next slide please so our health and counseling offices will be open regular hours of operation uh, the big change that we're going to do for the upcoming fall instead of allowing for walk-ins um, both health and counseling will manage um, clients, students, uh, faculty and staff that visit the areas on appointment basis only. So if a student wants to see uh, health services, they can reach out to health services via phone or email to correspond and set up an appointment so that we can have that student come visit health services. And likewise for counseling, we will have two counselors that are available daily, again, appointments only, but in the event that we do have a crisis situation and the student does need to talk to a counselor um, as soon as possible, we do have accommodations to provide that for a student, uh, both within the traditional business hours and also after hours. Uh, we wanna make sure our students know that we have a support system for them to deal with health, counseling, wellness, and any other issues that they may be experiencing. And the final area that I'll focus on is campus recreation. So campus recreation officially reopens Monday, August 3rd. So we're excited to have our students, faculty, staff, and community members uh, back in our facility. 
uh, to socially distance congregate, but to also take advantage of the facilities that we have to ensure that they promote health, wellness, and safety within their respective lives. Um, there will be some modifications, so things may look a little bit different. So Canvas Recreations team have worked with a series of partners to make sure that equipment, party equipment, et cetera, are socially distant as well, so at least six feet apart. So you may see some equipment in some not traditional areas, but again, we want to make sure that health and safety is a priority for those individuals who are working out in our facilities. Um, in addition to social distance, uh, we do ask that prior to the individual coming into campus recreation, that they do wear a facial covering. That's something that's mandated across our campus, but individuals who are entering the facilities do need to wear a facial covering. If they are working out in a cardio equipment, they are able to take off their facial covering, but we do ask if you're uh, doing activities that aren't strenuous or you're just walking around, we respectfully ask that you continue to use your mask or facial covering so that we can continue to implement safety processes for individuals who are in the facility. And once individuals exit the facility, we will ask you to make sure that you have your facial covering as you enter uh, campus after exiting campus recreation. In terms of intramurals, so intramurals uh, will be handled on a case by case basis, uh, primarily sports that are high contact or highly physical in which there may be some level of touch. Uh, those programs will be temporarily placed on hold, but there will be some programs that will offer both online fitness classes, intramurals that are less contact that our students can take advantage of. And the last thing that I focus on for campus recreation, uh, they do have an app. Uh, we highly encourage faculty, staff, students, and community members to download the campus recreation app for a few reasons. One, you'll get consistent updates in terms of hours of operations. If there are updates, that we need to share immediately. And also that helps us to do contactless entry. So students, faculty, staff, and community members can use their all cards, but the app allows them to download a, a scan so that they can scan walking into the facility versus having to transfer their car to an individual that's working. And that concludes the student experience section. Next slide, please. Thank you, Arnie. Um, we're going to transition now to um, questions and answers so we can stop screen sharing, I think, and come back to the group as a whole. And uh, Jason, uh, would you like to uh, field us some questions, please? Yeah, so um, one of the, uh, a few people have asked about um, how we will know if students are um, reporting on the health e at NKU app, if we will know, and if we will be notified if they report symptoms. I'll go ahead and answer that. Looks like Sue got frozen. Um, so all of the information is going to be funneled to a, a student affairs where it can be reviewed by a team. With all of the apps, um, we will not be known, we do not know if you report symptoms because that is private health information and we cannot get that information attached to your name. What we can determine, however, is whether you um, access the app and, and completed the assignment, as well as whether it has been recommended that you do not come to campus. Because you may, you may uh, not come to campus because you're reporting symptoms. You may also be requested not to come to campus if you've been in close contact with someone else who has COVID-19. You could also not come to campus if you do not acknowledge that you're going to follow our Healthy at NKU protocols, including wearing a mask and engaging in social distancing. So we will be able to determine the outcome of the survey as well as whether anyone, um, whether, well as whether you engaged in the survey. Now, if there's a particular need for someone on campus to know whether a student is uh, answering, responding to the questions, then I would have you direct that query to um, Student Affairs, and they'll be able to assist you. And to bring some clarity in terms of the uh, Student Affairs connection, uh, I'll use university housing as an example. So all residential students will be essentially collected into groups based on where they live. So based on where you, your location of uh, where you're living, 
your residence hall director will have access to not know the personal information, but know that our students are consistently checking in. Uh, one that helps us to ensure that we are uh, monitoring our residential students in terms of who's on campus, but it also allows for us to follow up with the students. So for example, if uh, student A has not completed uh, the app in a few days or a week, uh, we're able to follow up with that student to make sure that they, one, are, are doing okay and we need to provide them with resources. Two, uh, we can remind them to uh, complete the app. Um, I did receive a question from another town hall, so I'll, I'll share that response here. Uh, we are asking all residential students to complete the Healthy Aid KU app uh, every day. Um, since, you're, since you're going to be on campus, and you'll be engaging with individuals in the community. Uh, for our students who are commuting, uh, we ask that you commute, or that you complete the app uh, when you are arriving to campus or prior to your arrival campus. So even if you're just coming in for one class or if you're just visiting campus recreation, uh, we do ask that you complete the app prior to your arrival to campus. Thank you uh, for so, that. I, yes. Can I, can I just add one other thing that uh, associated with that topic uh, surrounding food and beverage? Uh, the reason that, that uh, our group is being so diligent about uh, the app and, and following up and so forth, um, in food and beverage operations, if for some reason we find out that we've had a positive COVID test um, and that person has been in any of the food and beverage operations and the health department does the contract uh, tracing and we, you know, we find out they were exposed to, you know, more than one or, you know, one person. Uh, the problem that we have is that we will be, it will be necessary for us to close down that food operation the day that we find out about the test and perhaps the next day as well, depending on how long it takes uh, to get the deep cleaning done. And so, um, I'm, I'm a member of the COVID-19 preparedness team. and We have been very vigilant about sort of how uh, we're setting this up and how we're following up. Um, and we talked uh, from the food and beverage perspective, we talked to Valerie a lot. We talked to Dr. Cohen, who most of you probably don't know uh, about things like this. So thank you, Sue. Um, Arnie, just a let me just let me just jump in, Jason. Before yeah. you go on, um, my internet is very unstable today, so uh, if I freeze, please just carry on. Um, but I just wanted to throw that in there. So, Jason, go ahead. Yeah, Ar Arnie, just a follow up uh, was a question: If a student is does have to quarantine on campus, how will they, they be monitored and cared for? Yep, so if a student is uh, quarantined on campus, uh, we'll receive that information from uh, health services. So we'll be able to follow up from a health perspective to make sure they have the resources that they may need. Um, in addition to uh, health services, um, as I mentioned uh, prior, we do have uh, professional staff who are actually living on campus. So they'll provide outreach to that particular student, either through email or virtually, uh, to just do check-ins and make sure they're okay. Um, in the event that we don't hear back from the student, then of course we'll go to uh, some additional means just to do a door check and, and make sure that the student um, has everything they may need. Um, in the event that the student does uh, test positive for COVID-19, um, we also encourage them to uh, just keep in contact with us. So any updates that they may have, we can provide the uh, best resources for them. Um, student Conduct Rights and Advocacy, or SCRA, uh, they also are, are vital in this process. So in terms of uh, professor uh, flexibility and accommodations, uh, we'll work with the particular professor to let them know that the student will be uh, away for an extended period of time and we'll ask the professor's flexibility to provide uh, some accommodations for the student to either do assignments later or work with the individual student's needs. Um, Lori, there was a clarification asked about uh, those who do need to take the two weeks away and if they need to use sick hours for those two weeks. So that depends. Um, the extended benefits are paid time, so they would not be using their sick hours, but in some cases it's full-time pay and in other cases it's two-thirds pay, so they may want to supplement that with their sick time. Um, and so we would work with them directly. Uh, I would have them talk to human resources and we would work through the plan to make sure that they're utilizing their benefits to the fullest. But no, typically they would not be using their sick time for that period. 
Um, could we also clarify uh, where testing is being done? It's not necessarily being done in our health clinic, correct? We do have a, a space on campus that's uh, outside of the health counseling and student wellness office. Uh, the location that we selected uh, provides for a minimal contact um, and minimal um, opportunities for um, any individuals getting tested to um, engage with anyone with the exception of uh, the health services uh, personnel. Um, and again, we're also doing appointments um, only for any walk or any um, health or counseling uh, areas. So we'll be able to be in contact with that particular person uh, to meet them outside or meet them in a location and get them to the uh, testing site um, as soon as possible. We talked about um, the safe campus training that the employees need to complete. Is there any kind of training that uh, students need to complete before the semester begins? So um, the same training that the employees need to complete, the student employees would need to complete, but not all students, just the student employees. Um, there was also some, uh, some question about clarification of the, the rules. For example, um, if students are eating on campus, uh, where they could remove their mask to eat or not, if they're allowed to eat in hallways, if we can clarify any of that. And who might enforce that was another question. Well, I'll, I'll jump in on this one. Um, many faculty um, routinely allow students to eat in their classes, um, which is fine. Um, but we're suggesting that uh, this fall that faculty actually don't allow that um, because of the um, need to remove the masks uh, while eating. So our recommendation is that uh, students utilize the, um, the dining areas on campus, the lounge areas on campus, uh, but to isolate their eating to those areas and try to avoid walking around campus eating uh, without a mask on. Uh, enforcement is an entirely different issue, of course, Faculty uh, have, you know, the right to request a student to leave their their classroom uh, if they're not complying with masking. But um, uh, I, we think that there's going to be a great deal of need for peer pressure and role modeling to um, support the the facial covering requirements on campus this fall. Jason. I can add just a couple of other things to what Sue said. Um, we will be erecting a significantly large tent uh, down by Norris Commons uh, with tables and chairs and some monitoring uh, for, for anyone to use, uh, primarily uh, Norris Commons folks, but anybody else could use it throughout the course of the day uh, for eating. Uh, we are not going to erect the same type of tent up on the plaza uh, but we will be adding some additional tables uh, during, you know, 1030 till two o'clock or so, uh, so that people have some places to sit and eat uh, between classes as they're, or as they're getting ready to go to class. Um, there's a question regarding um, how quarantining and working from home would work if uh, Ohio were to become a high risk state with 15% infection rate or higher, or if Kentucky became such, um, would the campus return to remote operations? Well, at this time, um, and in fact, it's a topic for discussion at the COVID preparedness team this, this afternoon and going forward, is to develop our actual protocols for when we would shut down. Um, so on the one hand, we don't have an actual answer to that yet. But if we do reach a 15% test rate, I'm pretty sure Ohio would shut down, Kentucky would shut down, so we would just be shut down with everything else. Um, so at, at a minimum, we're going to always comply with CDC, health department, and state regulations.
Um, there was also a question as to when uh, classroom assignments would be finalized for um, on campus hybrid classes. Zaidi, do you have that information? I know your team is working very hard to finalize all classroom assignments. They're working with um, the registrar's office and um, I'm, I'm pretty sure they should be in the final stages now. Um, but I'll check with uh, Adam and make sure that they are put up. But the intent was so that students know in advance. Um, I, I think they, they should be in the final stages. I'll, I'll try and circle back. Um, this this just uh, is a clarification around who would need to quarantine when. Um, so um, Lisa asks um, if you've been exposed to someone who tests positive, the, the Kentucky COVID hotline says I should quarantine at home until I've been testing to get a negative result for 14 days. It also notes that anyone I was around should also quarantine for 14 days even though this person was not directly exposed, this would be a second contact. Would the first and second level contacts also be asked not to come to campus for 14 days? So I can answer that. Um, decisions regarding whether one should quarantine should be made by the health department or by a healthcare provider. And part of that depends on what it means to be exposed to someone with COVID-19. And so what happens when you receive a positive test for COVID-19 is that the Northern Kentucky, assuming you live in Northern Kentucky, health department is notified. If you don't live in the Northern Kentucky region, then the health department that is associated with your home address would be notified. They would immediately contact you to begin contact tracing. Um, and then they would determine whether the people that you've come in contact with need to quarantine or not. So you would be receiving the recommendation for quarantine from a health professional. And it will depend on exactly the, the, the circumstances under which you are exposed. A similar question about exposure. If, if uh, the faculty or staff contracted COVID over the summer or travels to a risky state or internationally, if they can provide a positive antibody test once they are back from their trip, do they still need to quarantine? Yes, they do. Um, I also wanted to ask, there've been a number of questions about the commuter meal plan and why it might be being instituted this semester. That would be me. Uh, Jason, the commuter meal plan is a uh, project that's been worked on for the last couple of years. And it is uh, surrounded uh, around uh, feed development and also a IRU contract uh, with our food and beverage business partner, Chartwells. Uh, we went out to bid a couple of years ago. It's a very long process uh, for food and beverage services. And uh, we put out our RFP, which is the request for a proposal. We got proposals back. Uh, we chose Chartwells. Uh, one of the things that they recommended uh, was a commuter meal program so that we were able to develop uh, the entire food and beverage program for the campus uh, to keep it moving forward uh, you know, through the next 10 years of the contract. Uh, we went through an extensive uh, vetting process uh, with our committees, with SGA. Uh, we held we a held, uh, town hall meeting. Uh, we spoke with the cabinet on a number of occasions um, and, and moved it through the process and got it approved. Uh, we signed the contract, and so we're moving forward uh, with that fee uh, based on that circumstance. Um, Tim, this might be a question for you. Um, many employees have moved their computers home to work and uh, if they need to come onto campus for a few hours or one or two days a week, um, do they need to check out a laptop to do so or how would they manage that? Yes, we do have loaner laptops for that situation. We do expect 
many staff that are working mostly remote that do come to campus have taken their desktop home and they will need some type of technology on campus. So they just contact the help desk or Norse IT at nku.edu or go by the Norse Tech Bar and we will accommodate that. Um, if the university learns that there's been a positive uh, student testing for COVID and that student has been in a classroom um, and the instructor learns that that student has been in their class, is, is it suggested that that class then move online for a period of time? How will that be managed? So I could take that um, in the enhanced cleaning protocols. Um, first of all, the, um, the tracing of a particular person testing positive is done by the Northern Kentucky Health Department. Um, the, the people with whom that individual came in contact with will be contacted in order to um, do their isolation. As far as uh, taking the class offline um, to an online format, that will basically depend on when the next session is. Um, normally, uh, the classroom will remain available from our perspective. We are not required to take spaces, uh, physical spaces offline because somebody with a positive test case was there if uh, more than 24 hours have passed. So the, the decision whether to move that class um, to an online format will be made by the instructor in consultation with the deans over there. Um, there's a question from Matt about best practices uh, for face-to-face -face classrooms. If doors should remain open for airflow, minimum time uh, between classes for air exchange, and how spray bottles of cleaner should be shared, etc. So as far as the um, going in reverse order, for the spray bottles, they're available for in case somebody does need to use them. Um, leaving the doors open does not necessarily uh, is not one of the best practices. The best practice is to de-densify the campus. If there are less number, of, so this question was also posed by somebody else. The buildings are designed for maximum occupancy. That's how many uh, CFM uh, or the uh, exchange rate is calculated. We are expecting that all of the buildings will be re reduced in their occupancy to about 40%. So if nothing else changes, you have already doubled the air exchange rate that is designed for that building. Um, so practical, the other thing that we are doing is that we may be opening the air dampers, so allowing more air to go out and taking more fresh air. Um, why we don't do it 24 seven is because then we will play a havoc with the um, temperature and humidity control and humidity and temperature also play a role in the viral load uh, within buildings. So we don't want to tinker with that. We are, we, we have been assured by, by our peers and the industry in general that simply de-densification of the campus will, will help with that. And finally, coming to the um, um, cleaning supplies, um, the, the, the current disinfectants available on the market require 10 uh, have, a, have a label because they've gone through three tiers of, of testing. So the, the ones that are commercially available right now require a 10 minute um, uh, time before they can, they kill everything on the surface. So if you spray it, you have to wait for 10 minutes. That, that timing is simply not available between, between classes. However, if individuals do want to clean something, they're, they're more than welcome. That's why we're providing that. And, and also when they're leaving, if they want to clean up something before they leave, that's something advisable as well. Um, let me ask, a, um, there was a question about the library and if the hours will be shortened or changed from their usual time and if there will be extended hours available at finals week as previously was done. The library uh, hours will be um, uh, similar to what they've been in the past. Uh, they, they'll be a little bit shorter uh, due to um, the de-densification on campus and um, staffing availability. Um, we have those, uh, those library hours posted and um, I 
don't know the answer about finals time because at that point we'll be totally virtual. Uh, so I, I don't know uh, about the hours that, but we'll, we'll get that information and make sure it's posted on the website. I had a couple other questions related to um, employees whose spouse work, spouses work in the medical field or with COVID positive patients, and should they consider this possible exposure? Uh, no. Um, again, exposure. I mean, if you if you are concerned, you should talk to your healthcare provider or to the um, health department. But just because you are living with someone who works with COVID-19 patients, that does not count as exposure. Um, and then um, how is, uh, there, were, uh, there was a question about how is orientation going to be held? And I think we can answer that all orientations are virtual um, for the fall, correct? Yep, great. Um, um, there's a question from uh, a faculty member, if we can ask students to clean the desks or tabletops before the end of class to expedite cleaning between classes. So this is um, the um, approved disinfectants uh, from on the EPA list uh, normally have a, a three to 10 minutes uh, time for which the disinfectant must remain on the surface. This was discussed in great detail with the academic affairs group and the COVID group. Even if we had bottles enough for everyone and we gave them the bottles they, and, and they were to spray the bottle um, uh, on, the, on the desktop, it will have to remain there for up to 10 minutes before we can, we can, we can be sure, according to the label, that it has killed the virus. The class time between, the, between classes is not 10 minutes. The second is, the disinfectant bottle itself, once it has been held by one person, going into the hand of the other person, then gets contaminated as well. So it is not a best practice to be, to be using um, this for, for cleaning. However, um, if people feel comfortable doing that, they can bring their gloves, they can put on the thing and they can, they can clean. And, and so that's why we are not objecting to somebody cleaning, but it was not considered a practical solution, nor is it one of the best practices. Great. And uh, just because of time, um, we will follow up on the, the rest of these questions that we have not answered yet. And um, we also have our session Friday. So I will turn the time to you, um, Provost. Thank you, Jason. And, and thank you for moderating those questions today. Also, thank you to all of our panelists. Um, I really appreciated your presentations and the information you were able to give us. Uh, for more details on today's conversation, please be sure to uh, see the NKU Moving Forward Fall 2020 webpage. Um, also, uh, President Vaidya will be releasing a video on Friday about returning to campus. So please be sure to uh, watch for this video email. Um, as we continue to plan for and refine our plans for the fall, we will be updating uh, the moving forward plan. So please continue to look at the COVID-19 uh, uh, website for more details. I'd like to particularly thank all of the members of the COVID-19 preparedness team. These individuals have been working uh, diligently since March, or early March, and uh, have spent many long hours in helping to create this uh, moving forward plan. And then finally, thank you to all of our faculty, staff, and students for your commitment to our campus community and to keeping it a healthy and safe place to um, live and learn. So with that, I will say Good morning, good afternoon, <laughs> goodbye, and please stay safe and be well. Thank you.